All right, this is lecture 10 in linear algebra. And what we're starting today is in the new set of notes, chapter four on vector spaces. and linear transformations. So up to now, we considered Rn, which is the set of all column vectors with n coordinates. This is an example of a vector space. So there is the general definition of a vector space, which is the following. So we need something analogous to the real numbers. So what is called in algebra, a field is a set with two operations. Binary operations, that means you do things in pairs, two at a time. Addition and multiplication. And you can add, subtract, multiply, and divide by a non-zero number. Uh, so there's a, you can axiomatize this. There's a list of properties of addition and multiplication, but they're the usual ones. So you have associativity. So let's call this field F for the moment, F. Um, for all X, Y, and Z in F, X plus Y plus Z is X plus Y plus Z and x, y times z is x times y, z. We have commutativity of addition and multiplication. x plus y equals y plus x. x times y equals y times x. We have identity elements. There's a zero in the field. And there's a one in the field, so zero and one in the field such that x plus zero and zero plus x is equal to x for all x, and one times x and x times one equals x for all x. And you have inverses. For all x, there is a y such that x plus y is zero. And for all x not equal to zero, there is a z such that x times z equals one. And y is usually written as minus x, and z is usually written x to the minus one, x inverse. So the example you know and love you have the real numbers. You also have the complex numbers. Well, number z equal x plus yi, where <clears throat> i squared is minus one, and x and y are reals. So if you don't know the complex numbers, this is just something you need to learn. Find somewhere on the internet or in a book, properties of the complex numbers. So these are examples of fields. You can add, they're numbers that you can add, subtract, multiply, and divide. And they're always called in linear algebra scalars, since we rarely call them numbers, but it's just a matter of tradition. So what is a vector space? You associate a vector space, associated to every vector space has to be a field. So a vector space over V 
over the field F is a set with two properties, vector addition and scale or multiplication. So for all uh, u, v, w in the vector space v, you have associativity. You have commutivity. You have the existence of a zero vector. And you have the existence of an additive inverse, a vector w such that v plus w equals zero. And for all vectors v in the vector space and all scalars c in the field, you can multiply a, a vector by a scalar. And this also has the following very nice properties. Uh, so for all c and c prime, let's say in the field, c times c prime v is the same as c prime times v. And you have distributive laws. And of two sorts. So <clears throat> a vector space is a set. Well, actually, it really is a pair. You have a set and a field. And <clears throat> addition of elements in the vector space V is defined and satisfies these nice properties. And scalar multiplication of vectors by field elements is defined. And the most important example, of course, is the one we've studied all along, which is Rn. I should say the most important examples because the second most important example is Cn. These are all n-tuples of complex numbers. But there are lots of other examples. Uh, um, Suppose I take um, R square brackets T. This is a set of all polynomials. With coefficients in R. <clears throat> but you can add polynomials and you can multiply polynomials by scalars. Or C01, this is the set of all Continuous functions f from the unit interval to the reals. The unit interval is just the set of all t between 0 and 1. So, so if you look at some function, y equals f of t, defined from 0 to 1, that can be considered a vector in this vector space. So there are lots of vector spaces. <clears throat> and everything that we did for Rn carries over to an abstract vector space. So in particular, notions of linear combinations, linear dependence, linear independence, and so on. So we can say the following. We have V be a vector space and let V1 up to VK be vectors in V and C1 up to CK be scalars, be a vector space over the field F. So I can take each of these vectors and multiply it by a scalar. I can multiply V1 by C1, V2 by C2, and so forth. And then I can add these vectors. And this vector, this is a linear combination of V1 up to Vk. 
And <clears throat> if S is a set of K vectors contained in V, then just as we saw for Rn, the set of all linear combinations I uh, goes from one to K, C sub I, W sub I, is a subspace of V. And the definition of a subspace is exactly what it was in chapter one. Namely, it's a set of, it's a subset of the vector space that contains zero and is closed under vector addition and scalar multiplication. And we say that the set S, this set, is linearly dependent if there exist scalars C1 up to C sub K some can be zero, but they're not all zero, such that the linear combination is the zero vector. And S is linearly independent if S is not linearly dependent. So if a set is linearly independent, if some linear combination of the vectors in the set is zero, then every scalar, every scalar, all, all scalars must be zero. And everything we saw in Rn, all the theorems carry over unchanged to this more general setting. So for example, if the set W1 up to WK is linearly independent and if some summation XI WI I goes from one to K equals summation Y I W I I goes from one to K. Then the scalars X I and Y I have to be the same. They have to be equal for all I from one up to K. So exactly the theorem we proved about vectors in Rn that are linearly independent carries over word for word. There's no change whatsoever in the proof to this more general setting. And just as we had the notion of dimension for a subspace in Rn, we have the notion of dimension for a subspace in an arbitrary vector space. And the proofs of all these theorems are exactly the same. So theorem 4.7 in chapter 4 says the following, that S be a set of M vectors. This is a finite subset of a vector space V. And let W, I'll write it as S in brackets, be the subspace generated by S, which means the set of all linear combinations of the vectors W1 up to WK. That V1 up to VN be vectors in V 
that are contained in W. So they call these are vectors in W, which is a subset, so it's basically. If n is bigger than m, that is, if you have n vectors in a subspace generated by m vectors, then the set v1 up to vn is linearly dependent. And the proof is exactly the same. Exactly as in chapter one. And from this, we get uh, several important results. Um, let me just state some of them. This is the next theorem, theorem 4.8. So that S be a non-empty subset of the vector space V and let W be the subspace generated by S, then S contains a subset which is linearly independent. So S contains a linearly independent subset that generates W. And just to make things simple for us, let this be a finite subset. Um, so Proof, consider the set of all linearly independent subsets of S. The set S is finite, so it contains only finitely many subsets. Choose a largest one a maximal or largest subset that is linearly independent. Or oh, S prime. So you can draw a picture. Here's W. Here's S prime, and S prime generates some subset, which is contained in W. So the subspace generated by S prime is contained in W. I claim it's the whole thing. Well, If not, so if S prime is not all of W, then there is a vector let's see, how do I want to say this? Um, Let me do it differently. Uh, this is good, but I'll do it differently. So S 
So we have S in a subset of V and S generates a subspace W. So here is the vector space V, here is S, and this W is the subspace generated by S. Consider all subsets of S that generate W. Let S prime be the smallest one, minimal. So sitting in S prime, in S, there's a subset, which is the smallest subset of S that generates W. I claim S prime is linearly independent. If not, there exists some W sub I, let's say W sub K in um, what? Then if not, then there exist vectors W1 up to W sub K in S prime such that C1 W1 plus C K W K is zero. That is, there's some linear combination of these vectors that's equal to zero and C J is not zero for some j. So we have cj wk. So I can solve for wk. I get cj wk is minus c1 w1 plus cj minus 1 w j minus 1 plus cj plus 1 wj plus 1 up to ck wk. Cj is not zero, so I can divide by it. So Wj, I can write this as summation. I goes from one up to k, I not equal to j, minus Ci over Cj, W sub i. So Wj is a linear combination of the k minus one vectors W1, the vectors from W1 to WK with WJ removed. And then the subspace generated by the set of all these WIs, I not equal to J, is going to be the same as the subspace generated by all the WIs. And this set is a proper subset of this set, which contradicts the minimality of the set S prime. We chose S prime to be the smallest subset of S that generates W. And if that set is not linearly independent, I can throw away a vector and get an even smaller set. So S prime is linearly independent. Um, So if S generates a subspace W, then S contains a linearly independent subset S prime that generates W. And we say a set is a basis for a subspace W, a set called B, if B is linearly independent and B generates W. So this is exactly the definition of a basis that we're familiar with from chapter two and chapter one. And we get the following theorem 4.9. Every 
finitely generated subspace as a basis. And every finite subspace, there. and if B1 and B2 are bases for W, then the number of elements in B1 equals the number of elements in B2. And this number is what is called the dimension of subspace W. is the size or the cardinality or number of elements of a basis for W. So this is one of the key results in linear algebra. We proved this for the vector space Rn and its subspaces, but without changing a word of the proof, we get the same result for an abstract, an arbitrary vector space, or every vector space, which is definitely very nice. Now, there's one property of bases that's very nice. There are many properties of bases that are very nice. Um, but a basis is not unique. So let, well, let's say that V be a finite dimensional vector space. Say the dimension of V is equal to N. So that means every basis for V has N elements. And suppose we have two different bases for V. So suppose we have F consisting of vectors F1, 2 up to F sub N and G consisting of vectors G1, G2 up to G sub N that these be bases for V. So every vector in the vector space has a unique representation as a linear combination of the F vectors and also a unique representation, a different representation as a linear combination of the G vectors. So let V be a vector and let V be summation xi f sub i, i equal one up to n. This is a linear combination of the vectors in f. So what is called the coordinate vector of V, with respect to the basis f is I write it V in square brackets, subscript F. It's just these coordinates, x1, x2, down to xn, which is a vector in Rn. So in fact, this exhibits a one-to-one -one correspondence between the vector space Rn of dimension n and an arbitrary vector space of dimension n. Similarly, suppose V is a, it is a linear combination of the G vectors. Suppose V is summation 
y sub i g sub i i goes from one up to n and the coordinate vector of v with respect to the basis script g is y1 down to yn in rn so this vector v can be associated with the n tuple in many different ways for every basis for the vector space you have a coordinate vector which uniquely determines the vector v and it's natural to ask if you change the basis of your vector space how do the coordinate vectors change so this is a nice exercise in the use of matrices and um, i'm going to do it now so we shall prove that there exists an n by n matrix called capital P with coordinates P sub i, j, such that if you apply P to the coordinate vector of V with respect to F, you get the coordinate vector of V with respect to G. And P is called the change of basis matrix. So maybe before I prove this, I'll do an example. So let's take the simplest example possible. The simplest vector space is R2, and one basis is the standard basis. So let V be the vector space R2. Suppose E, E1, E2 is the standard basis. So E1 is the vector 1, 0, and E2 is the vector 0, 1. But another basis consists of the vectors f1, f2, where f1 is the vector 1, 1, and f2 is the vector 1, minus 1. So in R2, this is E1 and this is E2, 1, 0, and 0, 1. 1, 1 is that vector, that's f1. And one minus one is this vector. This is F2. So this is F1 and F2. This is E1 and E2, if you want to make this very concrete. So how do you express these vectors with respect to the vectors in one basis with respect to the vectors in the other basis? So I want to write E1 as some linear combination of F1 and F2. If I add F1 and F2, I get 2, 0. So I can write E1 as a half F1 plus a half F2. Right? You can check. And E2 is, if I subtract, I get 0, 2. So 1 half F1 minus a half F2. So the coordinate vector for E1 with respect to the basis F is a half, a half, and the coordinate vector for E2 with respect to the basis F is a half minus a half. So suppose I take a vector V and which is equal to let's say x1 e1 plus x2 e2 
Okay. So the coordinate vector for V with respect to the basis E is X1, X2. What is the coordinate vector for V with respect to the basis F? So V is X1, E1, but E1 is a half F1 plus a half F2, and X2, E2, E2 is a half F1 minus a half F2. So this is equal to a linear combination of F1 and F2. This is equal to X1 plus X2 over two times F1 plus X1 minus X2 over two times F2. So the coordinate basis for V with respect to the basis F is X1 plus X2 over two x1 minus x2 over 2. Let me write this like this, actually. This is one half x1 plus a half x2 times f1 plus a half x1 minus a half x2 f2. And let me call these coefficients y1 f1 plus y2 f2. So for the vector v, is y1, y2. So y1, this is y1, and this is y2. I can write this as a matrix. <clears throat> um, if I let the matrix P be a half, a half, a half minus a half, then P applied to X1, X2 is going to be exactly X1 plus X2 over two, X1 minus X2 over two, which is Y1, Y2. So if I take the coefficients of the vector V with respect to the basis E, and I multiply that column vector by the matrix P, I get this. So another way of writing this, this is P, the coordinate vector of V with respect to E gives me the coordinate vector of V with respect to F. So this matrix is, a, is what is called a change of basis matrix. If you take the, the change of basis matrix from E to F, if I write the vector, if I find the coordinate vector of V with respect to E, and I multiply that vector by the two by two matrix P, I get the coordinate vector of V with respect to F. So this is an important calculation. And the proof of the general result goes as follows. So this is theorem 413. So V is an n-dimensional vector space. Over the field F. 
And <clears throat> it's script F, the F1 up to Fn, be an ordered basis for B, and let G, the vectors G1 up to Gn, be another ordered basis for B. So for all j from 1 up to n, you can write the vector g sub j as a linear combination of the vectors in the basis f. Summation i goes from 1 up to n, pij f sub i. Actually, what we're proving is a stronger theorem, but that's fine. Uh, <clears throat> so that this be an ordered basis for V, and that this that G went up to Gn just be a subset of V. So write Gj is a linear combination of the Fs, and let P be this n by n matrix, then G is another basis for the vector space. If and only if the matrix P is invertible, has an inverse. So the easy half is to show that if P is invertible, then G is also a basis. Suppose P is invertible and the inverse is some matrix I'll call Q. Qij. And that means that P times Q and Q times P are the identity matrix. <clears throat> so to say that P times Q is the identity means if you multiply the matrix PQ, what is the ijth coefficient? It's summation PIJ Q PIK. UKJ. K goes from one up to N. And this is equal to delta IJ, which is one if I equals J and zero if I is different from J. Because the identity matrix has exactly that property. The coordinates where I equal J are one and the other coordinates are all zero. So we have this relation and So if I compute, right, so we're assuming P is invertible and Q is the inverse. And so P times Q is the n by n identity matrix. If I compute um, 
summation QKJ G sub J G sub K K goes from one up to N. What is that? GJ is this linear combination with respect to the Fs. So this is summation K goes from one up to N. UKJ summation I goes from one up to N. PIJ F sub I. If I interchange my summations, I goes from one to N. K goes from one to N. PIJ QKJ FI. This is exactly delta ij. This is zero unless i is equal to j. So when i is different from j, I get zero. And when i equals j, I get one. This is f sub j. So every fj is a linear combination of these k vectors, g1 up to gk. So g generates the vector space and the cardinality of G equal to N implies G is a basis because a vector space that's n-dimensional cannot be generated by a subspace with fewer than N vectors. So if this basis, if this matrix P is invertible, then G is a, is a basis. And now I want to prove the other half. Suppose G is a basis. So then every vector F sub J in F can be written as a linear combination of the G's. Summation Q, K, J, G sub K. K goes from one up to N. And we also had that every G was this linear combination of the Fs. G sub J is summation P, I, J, F sub I. I goes from one up to N. So if I take that and plug that into this relation, I get F sub J summation K goes from one up to N, Q K J, G sub K, the summation K goes from one up to N, U, K, J, G sub K is summation I goes from one up to N, P, I, K, F sub I. Again, I interchange summations. This is summation I goes from one up to N. Summation K goes from one up to N, P, I, K, Q, K, J, F sub i. So Fj is this linear combination of the Fs, but the Fs are linearly independent. So a vector has a unique representation as a linear combination of the Fs. That means these coefficients, they have to be equal to 1 if i is equal to j and 0 if i is different from j. In other words, Summation, K goes from one to N, P, I, K, Q, K, J is the Kronecker delta, which means P times Q is the identity matrix. So P is invertible. Okay. Now, 
right? The purpose today is to introduce some basic concepts uh, so you have some time to think about them before the semester ends, which is a month and a half normally, but a week uh, and a day for us. Linear transformations. Let V and W be vector spaces. A function T from V to W is a linear transformation if it satisfies the following properties. There are two of them. T of the sum of two vectors, T of V1 plus V2, is T of V1 plus T of V2 for all V1, V2, and V. T of C times V is equal to C T of V for all vectors V in the vector space capital V and scalar C in F. V and W are vector spaces over the same field. Whenever you have a vector space, it's associated with the field. Could be the real numbers, could be the complex numbers, could be something else. V and W have to be vector spaces over the same field. They're both real vector spaces or complex vector spaces. Now, whatever that case may be. So a function with these properties is called a linear transformation. Suppose that V is finite dimensional with the basis, say, E1 up to E sub n. So every vector V in V is of the form summation X sub I, E sub I, I goes from one up to N. So T of V is T of the sum. That is T of X1, E1 plus X2, E2 up to Xn, En. And by this linearity property of a linear transformation, this is T of X1, E1, plus T of X2, E2, plus T of Xn, En. And by the scalar multiplication property, this is X1, T of E1, plus X2, T of E2, plus Xn, T of En. So T of V is completely determined by T of E1 up to T of EN. If you know these N vectors, then you can completely describe T. Given the coordinate vector of a vector, given the coordinate vector of V with respect to the basis, you get the linear, you get the image of that vector in the vector space W. Hmm. Now, suppose W is finite dimensional with the basis F1 up to F sub M. So every vector W in W is a linear combination of these vectors. Summation Y sub J, Y sub I, F sub I. I goes from one up to N. 
So now we can do something. Very interesting. So we have T from V to W. And here we have a basis E1 up to EN. And here we have a basis F1 up to FM. So T of the basis vector E sub J is some linear combination of these basis vectors. It's called the coefficients that say AIJ. So T of EJ is this vector in W. So suppose we take a vector V, which is summation XJ EJ, J goes from one up to N. So the coordinate vector of V with respect to the basis E is X1 to Xn. So T of V is T of summation X, J, E, J. J goes from one up to N. This is summation J goes from one up to N. X, J, T of E, J. This is T of E, J. This is summation J goes from one up to N. X, J, summation I goes from one up to M. A, I, J, F sub I. This is summation. I goes from one up to M. Summation J goes from one up to N. A, I, J, X, J, F sub I. This is my summation. I goes from one up to N. Y sub I, F sub I. That is on this coefficient is the coefficient of the basis vector f sub i. y sub i is summation j goes from 1 up to n, a i j x j. So consider the matrix A equal a i j. This is an m by n matrix. So if I take the matrix A and multiply it by the coordinate vector of V with respect to E, what do I get? This is A11 up to A1n, AM1 up to AMN, X1 to Xn. What I get is an m-dimensional vector. The first coordinate is summation a one j x j. J goes from one up to n. Second coordinate is summation a two j x j. J goes from one up to n. Down to the last coordinate, summation a m j x j. J goes from one up to N, but this is exactly Y1, Y2 up to Y sub M, which is the coordinate vector of V with respect to the basis F. So I have a matrix associated to my linear transformation. Given a linear transformation T from a vector space V to a vector space W, if V and W are finite dimensional and uh -oh. I choose bases for them, then there's a matrix A such that A applied to the coordinate vector of V with respect to E gives me the coordinate vector of T of V with respect to F. So, So this is the amazing result 
that connects matrices to linear transformations. If you have a vector, if you have a linear transformation from one finite dimensional vector space to another, and you pick bases for your vector spaces, then your linear transformation is completely determined by a matrix. And conversely, every M by N matrix corresponds to a unique linear transformation from your vector space V to your vector space W. So this is really, really important. And I would encourage you to study this as hard as you can, because it is going to be, uh, it's a fundamental part of linear algebra. And so a fundamental part of what we do now for the next several weeks, remember every day is a week, uh, and definitely is on the final exam. Okay, that, that's a lot, but that's what we've done today.